Good morning. I thought I would just walk around the homestead a little bit and look at some projects, mostly trees and stuff like that. I don't have time for to do much else in terms of making videos right now. I don't know. We're going to look at whatever we run across. Let's just go, 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 go. All right. Here's the pear tree that uh, I was training up in another video. So let's take a look at the, the shoots we have growing here. I notched this one right here. I notched that one right there. So these are the ones that I want to grow. That one this way, this one that way, this one that way, and this one that way. And then the rest of these are basically, you know, they're extras. And the extra ones are also to help feed the tree so that the tree has leaves that can gather energy and, and feed the tree and grow the stem thicker. Like if I just reduce this to, you know, four shoots and, and one shoot at the top, it's collecting less energy and it can build less, you know, it can, it can gather less carbon and uh, grow less wood. So then it's going to wind up being more spindly and wispy. But what I'll do is I'll keep coming and checking and like, uh, let's say, okay, with this one, you know, this, this one that I want to grow looks less vigorous than this one here. So if this is rapidly outgrowing this and this just doesn't seem to want to grow, I may intervene and, and pinch this back or even take it out to, you know, funnel more energy into that shoot. So that's the kind of thing I should do through the rest of the season. What I have to do today is get a cage around this. Any morning I'm going to come out here and the deer will have munched is, you know, everything it can reach. I'm kind of lucky that hasn't happened yet. And this tree was really struggling for years. It's been here for over 10 years, I think. The graft I put on it would never grow. It, like it just didn't want to grow. I don't know if it was incompatible or what. But the roots were there slowly getting established anyway. Uh, but the thing never grew more than about three and a half feet tall. The graft died and then the rootstock started to take off. And I was like, okay, well, you know, that grew like 12 or 14 inches in one year. So there's something there. Like there's a root system here I can exploit. Just kind of trimmed off all the lower branches. I mulched this. I threw some fertilizer on it. I came out here and peed on it like, I don't know, 40 times or something like that all around this area. Then it went nuts and I watered it a couple times last summer. And so all of this growth from that point where you see it's not painted anymore, that's all one year's growth right there. So with this mulch here, this, this should do real well this year, I think, especially if I manage to get in here and water it a couple times. You think I can get this fence over that tree without damaging it it seems unlikely doesn't it but it would save me having to open the open the fence up uh, i think i'm gonna make it ow ow <laughs> nope if the fence was rigid oh here we go maybe i don't want to break any of these shoots I did it. So this is an experiment with uh, fruit tree understories that I started about maybe eight or ten years ago, I'm guessing. Uh, I'm going to try not to go on like a, a rant here, but there's a lot of like what I would call cookie cutter permaculture. And a lot of techniques and ideas are basically developed in areas where there there is a... Uh, rainfall during the growing season and here we have no rainfall during the growing season so competition for water and competition for water means competition for nutrients because if there's no water the plants can't get the nutrients this is a major driving factor in this environment if i let weeds grow all around the trees you know up into june they're going to take a lot of stuff out of the soil and there's only so much water to go around right there's not just like an endless supply of water that's coming up you know, up from the subsoil or anything like that. So the idea that I had, and it was inspired by this plant right here, which is um, Narcissus, which is the, the small daffodils that are really smelly. You know, they have like a really, really strong scent. I just noticed that those would grow really vigorously and thickly, and then they would die early in the season. My idea was to make what I call a dying mulch. So I plant these bulbs under the tree. They grow really vigorously, and since they have a bulb, they can push a lot of early growth faster than like a, something that has to grow from seed. So a seed drops in, it starts this root system, it gets a few small leaves, and it's just gathering resources, and it's growing a bigger root system. Well, the bulb already has this big energy storage unit there, and it can just rapidly push a lot of growth. So if you look in here, you can see that there's almost no weeds growing in here. If there were perennial weeds in here, like weeds that grow from the roots, same roots every year, this could end up being more of a problem. And I think that's 
maybe the Achilles heel of this, this system or one of them. But as you can see, now that this is well established and that, that took a while, it really is out competing almost all the weeds. There's just a few pale spindly weeds like down in here. This won't actually just sit there and grow until all the water is gone, which most perennial weeds will. Like, like a lot of people would say, oh, why don't you plant comfrey under your trees? Well, because they just suck the water endlessly like they, they will just keep taking every drop of resource they can get out of the soil until there's not enough and then they start to wilt they'll wilt and they'll just sit there all summer just trying to survive so they're offering competition with the tree throughout the entire season but these are on like a internal timer basically like you know if it's a real wet year they might go a little bit longer but you can see they're already winding down and sometimes by about May 15th, they're just flat and brown and they're not taking anything else. But not only are they not taking anything, but they're leaving this, you know, I mean, those get a lot skinnier and smaller, but they leave this big mat of vegetation. I've outcompeted the weeds and I've dropped a dying mulch on top of the soil that's actually going to shield the soil from the sun and that's the idea. I have two plants that have performed well for this. One is the Narcissus and it's only some varieties of Narcissus and the only one that's performed really well is the Chinese sacred lily. Um, this is this should be a whole video and I just haven't got around to doing it yet. And then the other one is uh, what are called naked ladies. Amaryllis belladonna is the Latin name, unless they changed it, which they like to do just to confuse us and because it's job security for botanists. Um, those are the only two that have really performed well. And I, I would say of those two, the, the naked ladies are a better performer. They also die a little bit later, like about two to three weeks later. I'm at the point now where I've done the preliminary work and I think the next steps are, I have spent some time looking for other plants to try, but I think looking harder for more plants and kind of reaching out to other plant nerds and trying to find you know plants that will do this well but the other one is planting like more more of a trial system like someone in a mediterranean climate like this which by the way the, the whole point of this is that it suits a certain growing situation most places you know east of the rockies it rains in the summer it just doesn't do that out here in the west so anyone who lives in a mediterranean climate could try this but you know i think a, a situation where there's an orchard that's fairly homogenous, right? So if you plant a block of trees, they're all gonna do roughly about the same, but then maybe every other one or in blocks do this and see how they perform over, you know, about 10 years or so, or, or longer, of course. To see real results, we're lo really looking at, it's a long-term investment, you know? But again, I think the Achilles heel is gonna be, well, there's two things. One is if you get perennial weeds in here that are going to, you know, grow, they have the energy in their roots too. You know, they're not growing from a seed. So they're going to be able to poke their heads up here above and grow. And I just haven't experienced that yet, but I think it's just a matter of time. And the other one is that since this stuff's growing pretty close to the trunk there, it provides cover for rodents. So if voles want to move in here and eat my, the bark off the tree trunks, that could be a problem. You might need to leave 18 inches around the trunk or something like that with no bulbs in it or you put in a metal collar. It's neat though. I'm, I'm actually very encouraged and I'm, I'm pretty much ready for phase two if I can pull that off. This is uh, similar, except in this one I just put, I think it's all daffodils. So it's all different varieties of daffodils. And most of them just don't perform as well as that particular one, which not only grows very vigorously, it grows big, thick, wide leaves. It grows them early and it dies earlier than the rest of them. So that's why it works. This is my early Franken tree. This is Carrie Pippin, which I'm not that impressed with really. Overall, I've just kind of given up on getting really into that variety. I think it's okay, and I think it's it's potentially really valuable for breeding. I just have better stuff here. So this branch I'm gonna graft over this year. I'll probably leave like one or two things of Carrie Pippin on it, you know, one or two branches, maybe that one over there. But the rest I'm putting uh, Centennial and Trailman, which are two early crabs. Uh, Trailman I've had and it's excellent. Centennial I thought I had, but it ended up being a mislabeled um, Trailman. I got Centennial Scions this year from Chris Hamanix and he dropped by with a cooler full of plant material uh, gave me a ton of apple science he's like a serious you know high level fruit collector definitely on another level than i am
and he really hooked me up. It was cool to hang out with him. He also breeds tree collard, so we'll go look at my tree collard, and I can tell you about that. These are all crosses, so everywhere we walk around and you see red tags like this are cross-pollinations that I made this year. And this is Trailman. Again, it's an early season. I've seen it ripen here in July. Very high-quality crab. If anything, it's lacking in acidity and tannin. And it's very sweet. It's very polite. It's got a really nice uh, flavor that the crab get maybe it's malty it's a, the, whatever the thing that Wixen has it has some of that they, I think there's just a lot of potential with this variety people grow it in very cold areas someone I just heard from someone in Saskatchewan I know a guy in Alaska that grows it it's extremely hardy and so I've put a bunch of different stuff onto it like right now I'm just trying to get a bunch of new genes into the trailman line and then you know we can go from there so this is Wixen crossed with Rubiot um, this is one of my seedlings that's Wixen Rubiot this one is Pendragon. This is the first year I've used Pendragon. Pendragon's a red fleshed apple. I think it's from Wales. It's um, got very red leaves and blossoms and everything, but I've never had the fruit. But I figured just throw some red flesh genes into this variety. Williams Pride, again, red flesh and scab resistance because Trailman gets scab really badly. Pink Parfait, more red flesh genes. Chestnut crab, an excellent, you know, crab apple, also early. So there's a potential right there. Just in this cross here, for a great, very sweet, very high quality early crab apple, as I think I did several of those. And of course, Wixen, that's a no-brainer. Wixen and Trailman together, no-brainer. And I know there's other people that have made that cross, like the guy I know, I know in Alaska, uh, Square Peg Man. So I could just go around and talk about crosses all the time, but let me just do this one. So this is Wittick Pippin. It's spelled Whitwick, but uh, Nigel Deacon says it's pronounced Wittick. I put all other late hanging apples on here because it's a late hanging apple. It's not as late as some of them, but it's definitely late enough to work with. So I put Lady Williams, Allen's Everlasting, Pomocinel, Pink Parfait, Appaloosa's, you know, one of my crosses between Grenadine and Lady Williams. My attempt to start mixing up those late hanging apple genes and just, just start getting mixes of those together to, you know, use in the future for more crosses. Whitwick Pippin is an excellent apple, so we could get something really good, because most of those varieties I put on there are really good eating apples too already. But then there's also the potential to recross. So this is grenadine, and you can see it has a, quite a bit of red trait expression in the in the blossoms, I mean, compared to everything else in here, except you can see back in there, that's Rubiot, which is related to it. And there's Christmas Pink back there, which is also related. And they all have these uh, distinctively pink blossoms. And most apples don't really have that. They'll just have a little bit of pink blush like this one right here. But there's a, there's a definite difference there. So here's the nectarine that I grafted in a video. I did two videos. One was me just grafting a nectarine which I think ended up dying. So what happened is I, I did three, and these are all seeds that I planted. Or they're wild, bitter almond seeds. I planted those in place, and then I chip grafted them late in the summer. One of them just died, like it just, the bud dried out and didn't make it. And another one I killed by accident. I think I, I hit it with my fingernail or something and killed it. But one of them lived, and that's this one. You know, it grew like two inches and then it stopped. But now it's it's raring to go. So this shoot right here will end up being the new tree. I kind of want to leave one of these still, but I'm going to pull pull one of them out. So I could replant this as a rootstock somewhere. I just don't really need it. And then with this one, I don't have my clippers with me, which is weird. I should always have them this time of year in my back pocket. But I'm just going to reduce this to like a couple of shoots and let that grow for a little while, uh, maybe through the entire season even. I'm not really worried about competition because this is on a pit, eight foot wide, three foot deep pit full of all kinds of yummy garbage and uh, charcoal. So this tree is gonna do really well here. And the reason I put this here in this really nice, you know, heavily amended pit is because Mark Albert says this is his best fruit tree in terms of productivity and reliability and quality, all things combined. He's just really into this uh, variety. So this is a plant called uh, Yerba Mansa and it grows in the Southwest. I don't know what its total range is, but I think it's basically the Southwest in Mexico. 
it grows in wet areas. This is my spring overflow. So I planted some here and in a couple of different areas on the property where there's a little bit more water. Extremely valuable medicinal or considered so in the areas it grows. I mean, every area has these plants, you know, these medicinal plants that are considered like the highest level of value. For instance, like ginseng would be one of those. And this is this is one of those plants. And uh, this was sent to me by my awesome friend, Bethany, who went out in the rain and dug me some roots and shipped them to me uh, because she's awesome. And you can see this is a spring overflow, so there's certain plants that like to grow around that. Horsetail is one. Here's some mint that somebody planted. This isn't native mint, uh, it's like a spearmint. Most years I'll come out and gather some of this and dry it for the year because it doesn't keep very well, so you should, you know, gather it every year. This is a uh, monkey flower, and it's not blooming yet, but it's getting close. I can see this is going to be a flower bud right there. And this has real pretty little yellow flowers, but it likes to grow in watery areas like this. While we're up here, I'll just grab a drink of water too. Yum. This is an apple uh, that just sprouted up here. You know, some bird dropped a seed and I guess since it was near the spring, you know, it survived. And I think I grafted something onto it, but I can't actually remember but I'm just kind of training it this year. Like this is gonna be one of the main branches. This is one of them all trained up high so the deer can't reach them. And then there's another apple here down again by the spring overflow. That's, I think I grafted that to something, whatever it's fruiting this year, I'll find out what it, what it is. I basically just can't keep up with the amount of biomass I have. So people will be like, oh, you know, why don't you burn it, the charcoal this way and you know, you'll get more charcoal and stuff. I just can't even keep up burning the very simplest methods. So I basically yarded all this stuff up and there's more up in the woods with the plan of building two identical piles, like as identical as possible, and then lighting one from the top and one from the bottom to compare how they burn, both for my you know knowledge and to show how much less smoke you get when you light from the top. The timing is that I have to get them built, let them dry a little bit, and then still have time to burn before the wet season is over, which is not gonna be that long. So realistically, this may not happen this year, which is, it's kind of bad because this is a fire hazard to have all this stuff just laying out here. If we get a wildfire and it comes through and catches this, it's just gonna throw more sparks. And this is, you know, near the forest and everything. Here's a couple of olive trees and it looks like they're about to flower pretty quick here. So, you know, they're old enough that I might start getting some significant fruit. I definitely had some some fruit lately. This is Nochilara uh, boliche, which was uh, some kind of promising table variety. I did a lot of research on which varieties to grow. You know, and these are old enough now that I think I can uncover them. Let the deer eat them a little bit. It'll just cause them to grow up, you know, above the deer basically. The only thing I'm really worried about is whether the deer, the bucks rub the trees with their antlers so much that they cause, you know, really serious damage. But I think we can take this off now. <laughs> Cut some of this off, but kind of uh, spread these branches out with branch spreaders. So check out the bloom on those apple trees. These are my interstem trees and I'm replacing Two that got killed by bears, one that just died from uh, sunburn and borers and wasn't productive anyway, it was Newton Pippin, which Newton just doesn't do well here, even though it's a great apple. Uh, that's my garden. There is no garden, basically. I have some tree collards and some kale from last winter. So probably not gonna have a garden this year, or very little. I might buy a couple tomato plants soon, just so I have something. I just don't have the energy. I don't have, uh, I can rarely work a full day anymore. So this is interesting. This is um, Brubinette, which I used as a parent a couple of times. In fact, I have some blooming this year, some offspring of this, but it just hasn't performed that well here. I mean, it gets really, really high grades, favorite lists and all that, but it just has not performed that well here. So I'm gonna graft over it and you know graft it to different varieties. It's still a good foundation tree. But anyway, what's interesting is how red these flowers are. You know, these are as pink as some of the red fleshed varieties, like the Edder type varieties. So I wonder if it has any of those red flesh genes lurking in there. I forget what the parents of Rubinette are. I'm thinking it's Cox Orange Pippin and Golden Delicious, but I can't remember for sure. So that one, this one, which is Carrie Pippin, I'm grafting over these to different varieties. You know, I'm probably gonna use them to test new varieties that I get. Like I have a bag full of signs, I need a place to graft. So hopefully later today I'll be, you know, working on these. 
This one I did a charcoal pit, and so I, I get all this food waste every week and I throw buckets of it in there, throw in some charcoal, throw in some dirt, and just layer it up like that. So that's going to be another one. It'll be interesting to see how that performs. And then this one was broken by bears. I probably will just replace it because once it, they start suckering like this, it's just, you just can't control it. I think I'm better off just digging that out and starting with a new tree. And the one thing I would say with the inner stem trees, the only real problem I've had with them is suckering, which can be very bad. Um, but apparently you can prevent it by planting all the way up to the interstem, to the dwarf interstem, and burying the interstem just a little bit. So in other words, if the interstem roots, it somehow suppresses the suckering lower. And I believe I observed that in the latest interstems I put in, the very last ones, I think I planted those deeper. Um, this one's suckering a little, but not too bad, but some of them like this and that one are just suckering really, really bad. So if you do interstem trees, I highly recommend burying the interstem just a little bit in the soil. And later today, I need to come back to this Wixen branch. Uh, I did a video on this and I'm pollinating that with uh, just the mixes of pollen. So there's probably gonna be up to, you know, over 20 different parents pollinating this one branch. And the net is just to keep bees out. My tree collard selection, peasant king, still performing. These are all tree collards grown from seed. And the reason tree collards are cool to me is that they don't flower in seed very often. And as you can see, a lot of these are flowering and seeding. These were actually grown from seed, brought from Montenegro by a friend of mine. And all of them have gone to flower except two. Uh, this kind of wispy looking one right here has never flowered and my selection, Peasant King. So look at that, like look how tall and thick and straight. It's got big leaves. It looks kind of ratty like all the lower leaves because birds love this stuff. But you can see everything else has gone to flower in the past and that's the one that still hasn't, even this year it didn't. I'm uh, very encouraged by that and even more excited. Um, fortunately, most of the first cuttings I took did not take. They just sat there and some of them rotted. I just put some more cuttings in and I should have, you know, more cuttings later this season to propagate. At the very least, hopefully I'll get them to people who will propagate them and will distribute cuttings. I'm pretty happy with the performance of this system, the diagonal cordon. So they're just trees planted at an angle on a trellis. These are very, very poorly maintained. Um, in most areas, you want to maintain them as a tight column that it doesn't have very many, you know, long branches on it. But I just haven't kept up with pruning them and taking care of them. But even so, it actually works pretty good. The problem with not taking care of them is that you end up with fruiting wood way towards the outside of the tree. And then when you cut it back to like, you know, rein them in, you cut off all this. I mean, look at this. This is just covered in, in fruitlets now. And if I want to rein this back in and train it the way that it's supposed to be trained, you can't just let them grow wild and expect them to do their best. So that means I have to come in here and prune stuff back even closer than this. If you're not careful, you can end up with things where there's not that much fruiting wood in the center here, like down close to the trunk where it should be. And then you have to cut off the fruiting wood that there is out here. But this is what it should look like, more like all these little spurs and stuff like that right there. It's an easy system to maintain because you can reach everything, but you should maintain it and you should prune it in the summer at least once and then again in the fall or winter or even three times a year. It just depends on how much of a control freak you are and how organized you are. These are the new tree collared seedlings. Uh, this one in particular has looked very good and there's some other good looking ones here too. Managed to get one peasant king plant right here, but it's kind of overgrown by this huge seedling and it was put in much later. Uh, I should probably dig that plant up and move it. Now I heard from a couple people who bought this watering can, the Haas, um, I forget what it's called, professional two and a half gallon maybe. It's an awesome can. I have no regrets about buying that can. It was a lot cheaper when I bought it. Often I don't use the rosette, it's you know the rose rather, it's somewhere around. Oh by the way if anyone wants a really good gopher trap this is overall the best gopher trap I've ever used. I, I did get another one to try out like a year or so ago. It works sometimes, but I find that it's not awesome. But these, the Gulfinator uh, from, I think it's Trapline Products. 
They're stainless steel, super durable. And I, I think I caught the first six golfers I went after with these traps, which is just a phenomenally good success rate. And before that, I favored the black hole traps, the round black hole traps, the old style. They serve different purposes and they work in different situations. But between those two, I think that's a good way to go. As I often do, I lost a whole bunch of apple seedlings this year to mice. And, you know, I had traps in here, but this trap's awful. It's JT Eaton Company. Do not buy their mouse traps. They're awful. The mice eat the bait out of them all the time and they won't go off. But there was a whole row here that got eaten. Um, all of these, there was a whole row there that got eaten. I need to make some wire covers or some, some kind of little wire cover box that goes over them because this has happened over and over again. For some reason, mice like apple seedlings when they first emerge. So now I have three traps out in here. In some other Day on the Homestead video, I was propagating this contorted San Pedro cactus, and they all took, I think, one, of, one cutting died, and it was like the super small little tip of one. But everything else is rooted, and most of them it look like they're going to start to grow. Like this one's definitely growing. See how light green it is right there? Um, this one's sending up a little bud right there. Here's this year's peasant king tree collared cuttings. Uh-oh, uh -oh. this one has aphids on it, which will spread to the other ones. If I could just rub and wash most of them off, that'll help. The asparagus bed. So not only is it going to be a good apple year, very clearly, but this are my seedling trial rows and look at all the blossoms in there. So I went around and counted and I have over 50 apple seedlings blooming this year. I probably fruited a little over 20 so far. That's a big jump. Like this year is a big jump from, you know, maybe 22 or 25 to, to 50. Again, always looking for this, pink petals like that. And I don't think this one has ever fruited yet. So that, that looks real promising. And that's either going to be Gold Rush or Wixen. From the looks of it, I'd say it's a Wixen, but... Yep, Grenadine Wixen. Looks like this one actually set some fruit. This is, uh... Yeah, this is Granny Smith uh, pollinated with Grenadine. That was pollinated by my ex-girlfriend that used to live here, who I still really am not over. How long does that take? It's been like five, six years. She wanted to make that cross. She wanted to call it Granny Dean. Here's an example of really bad burnout. These are trying to grow roots into the air, basically. Like all these little nubs are potential roots. Uh, the good side is that you can root these really easily, but the bad side is that these are prone to all kinds of problems. They can choke off the growth of the tree like you see right here. They are a site where uh, borers like beetles often lay their eggs and get grubs in there. So it's really problematic. Like one that, that's this bad, the fruit just would have to be really, really good to bother growing it. And you can see on this one, it's like there's burnout all the way up here. So it's gonna be on all the branches and stuff like that. Of course, if it's just absolutely amazing, I'm, you know, I'll grow it anyway, but definitely points off for that. Ooh, here's a new one. So this is Rubiot and King David. It only has that one little cluster of flowers. That often happens in the first year they flower, they'll just produce a little bit. So this is another generation. The first generation, all these big trees, every one of them has grenadine as a parent. And then the other parents are Wixen, Gold Rush, Golden Russet, Lady Williams. Yeah, not very diverse. These trees are the, the next year that I did. And I think those are 2011 and these are 2013 because I took a year off. Yes, that's correct. So let's see what these are. This one is Rubiot, Rubinette. So again, I, I'm not crazy about Rubinette here, but I think, you know, it has a lot of good genes, so... I'm not sure why I used it. It just probably was on spur of the moment. Okay, so there's one of those, two, three, yep, four. Yes. So there's four Cherry Cox Rubinette crosses blooming, one, two, three, four. And there's more, you know, for later. Well, if it can get more exciting than that, Sweet 16 and Rubiot. Oh, hell yeah. That's what I wanna see. This must be something else. More Sweet 16 Rubiot, and that's like a bunch of these right here. But only, looks like maybe three of them are flowering. And then we tried this last year, but I'm hoping it's gonna be a better, make better fruit this year, just cause it's getting more established and everything and there's more fruit and stuff. It's uh, Wixen and Rubiot. So there's two of those, two blooming, so that's cool. And then down here, Maypole and Wixen. Like here, 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 that one. 
and that one all show the columnar trait of maypole. You know, straight stems without a lot of side branches and really closely spaced buds like a dwarf. It's real dwarfish. That's definitely transferable and they'll tend to just grow these straight stems without a lot of branches and just, you know, covered in fruit. Uh, this is another Wixen maypole cross, but obviously it doesn't have, it's not expressing the red gene, but we could end up with a columnar Wixen-like apple which is pretty neat. Columnar trees are cool for restricted spaces. So you can see the difference here. Like this is the, the graft and it has this dwarfish thing where like the buds are really close together. They're like, you know, one quarter to three eighths of an inch. And then this is the rootstock, which is also red fleshed. It's um, bud nine, just regular shoots with big spaces between the buds. You know, that's something people could intentionally breed for is that columnar trait because there are other ones out there and uh, one i have that grows similar maybe not a full-on columnar tree is uh, allen's everlasting i did have some pollen of that too this year for sale i did actually make a cross on this because i figured if this fruit turns out to be really good i'll have already you know made another cross onto it of another red fleshed apple with Wixen. So this tree isn't tagged. I'm guessing it's maypole Wixen, but it could be maypole chestnut. It could be maypole pink parfait, maypole rubiot, who knows. But clearly it has the columnar trait as well. These are much younger trees and only those couple are blooming. So it looks also like the maypole may be very precocious, like it may just bear early in its life. And all of these really red ones, those are all maypole crosses, because maypole is the one I've used with the most red uh, gene expression. You see this gully here? Look how deep that gully is. Probably 15 foot deep at the deepest part, I'm gonna guess. I'm pretty sure that entire gully was formed by runoff from the road by a poor road design. Like, I don't think there was a gully here, like maybe a low depression or something like that in the ground that the water kind of gravitated toward. I think this happened because the road was poorly designed, poorly built, poorly maintained, and then just abandoned, and that it basically became a means of gathering water and funneling it down here where there should be no water and created this huge gully. All that soil's gone and you, you know, you just can't put it back. The messed up thing really is that these gullies, by cutting way down into the subsoil like that, they drain water out of the ground and they lower the water table in the whole area. So I have my orchard up here and garden and everything like that. Well, this is a means of draining that entire area more than it would otherwise. And this causes like, you know, generalized problems in the area. And so this is why you should maintain your roads and, and possibly think that, hey, you know, when you're not here, what's going to happen to your road that you're, that you're building or working on? So here's Pendragon. You can see that it also has a, a lot of this red um, trait expression. I wouldn't be surprised if this also has even red in the wood. Yep, very much so. So this could be an entirely different line from, you know, the, the line that other red flushed apples come from too, which is valuable, you know, to get more different genes. This is another tree understory experiment I did with uh, oriental poppies, which are perennial. They just form this big mound of vegetation like that. And they maybe have some potential, but they die down way too late and they just haven't performed. And whatever these purple things are, I can't remember, purple hyacinth or something, uh, they just don't do a very good job at controlling weeds and they die back too late. So this big stinking pile of garbage is uh, one of my charcoal tree pits. This is 10 foot diameter, three feet deep, and it's ready to plant. And I'm planting bite me on here. Um, this branch right here is the bite me branch. It flowered like crazy this year. So this is gonna set, you know, tons and tons of fruit. I'm gonna have to thin it really heavily. I'm gonna graft a new bite me tree, put it here. And I probably won't grow an entire tree of bite me apples, but it's gonna be the base of the tree because it's a very vigorous, you can see it's like outgrowing the rest of that tree. It's a very vigorous uh, variety. I think it'll make a good base. I'll just graft other stuff onto it but I'll have you know a good size maybe a full branch or two of, of uh, bite me because it is really a good eating apple anyway um, this pit's supposed to be finished but I haven't got the new pit dug yet I'm, it's like halfway dug so I keep throwing garbage on top of here I just I get this garbage every week I have to do something with it you know once I get the new pit dug I'll, I'll rake all this in clean up all the trash uh, cover this with dirt and charcoal and it'll all be good 
And all of this was generously donated by Spare Time Gardening. And Andrew, the manager, watches uh, my YouTube channel. And he called me up or emailed me and he's like, hey, I work at Spare Time up here. They're a big uh, wholesale distributor of garden supplies of all kinds. And he's like, yeah, we have a lot of, you know, stuff around that at the end of the year, broken bags and stuff like that. I can use any of it for your apple breeding project or other projects and I was like oh yeah so I drove up last year and this year and he loaded me up with all kinds of great stuff which is great uh, all, there's all kinds of fertilizers planting mediums chicken manure this is crab meal there's you know alfalfa pellets just general fertilizers cool stuff so thank you very much to uh, Mike and Andrew spare time gardening now I just have to get actually get the stuff used up in the ground and all that. So this is uh, probably my most successful tree understory experiment. This is Amaryllis belladonna. Actually, this this one right here is a hybrid between the regular naked lady Amaryllis belladonna, which is pale pink, and some African one that's more red. So this is like a hot pink, a hot pink naked lady. As you can see, it's done quite well and it smothers out almost all the weeds. I see a thistle over there in that corner that made it. But yeah, it's just incredible. And when this dies, it covers the ground completely. Like there's no dirt showing. So like I said, the next phase would be to do some more kind of serious trials. So this is kind of cool right here. I planted uh, three walnut seeds and they're from a variety called UC7680. I posted this on Instagram. By the way, if you don't follow me on Instagram, I do a lot of kind of like educational posts. And, you know, I usually most of my content there actually talks about things. Anyway, I planted uh, three of these walnuts because I want to see if I can grow a new variety of walnut. UC7680 is this walnut with huge nuts that are very thin shelled and very easy to crack and really delicious. They're extra sweet. They're definitely extra tasty and mild with less bitterness. So I figured why not just plant three? I may just let all three of them grow together you know, because the point is really to trial them to, to see what I get. And I have no idea. That could take 20 years for a walnut to grow from seed and bear. I have no idea. But I did that in another spot too, so I'll have two of those.